Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. I'm Dr. Mo, and my podcast is focused on lifestyle, self-care, personal empowerment, and positive relationship. I'm a best-selling author, award-winning podcast host, keynote speaker, and speaker coach. My goal for every episode is to entertain, educate, and elevate your mindset for the important work of continuous personal improvement. If you're new to the show or a returning visitor, let's make this official and hit that subscribe button. Now, if you enjoy the topics, please help us grow, reach more listeners. All you got to do is subscribe and rate the show. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure, my soul is safe. Hey, have you ever wondered if you're a good enough parent? Have you experienced burnout, feared you'd never get it all done? Well, my special guest today is Dr. Susan Landers. She is here to help all of us who feel that way, despite our best efforts, who feel we're just not really making a difference. Dr. Landers is a retired neonatologist who practiced full-time in the NICU neonatal intensive care unit. We'll be referring to it as NICU. She did that for 34 years while also raising three children. She suffered physician burnout. Physician burnout. It is a thing. Burnout for all of us is a very real thing, but she managed to overcome it. And now she helps others regain passion about their purpose. Dr. Landers, welcome to the show. Oh, Dr. Mo, thank you so much. What a kind introduction. It it a, a well deserved kind introduction. You have dedicated your life to healthcare, to helping others, to helping your family, and now you're continuing even in retirement. My first question for you is: What was it like to work in a NICU for over thirty years? Well, uh, neonatology, the care of sick newborn and preterm infants, was delightful most of the time, but it was very delightful most of the time, but stressful other times. Critical care medicine does not appeal to everybody. It did appeal to me. Lots of procedures, lots of cutting edge technologies, lots of decisions to be made, lots of emergency deliveries to attend. But there was also something special and intimate about NICU, and that was getting to know the parents, especially the mothers of my patients. Sometimes I could attend a delivery of a mom having a premature baby, maybe a set of twins, take care of that baby for four or five months in the hospital, seeing the mother every day, taking care of the baby as it recovered and grew and thrived. And then I had the pleasure of sending that baby home and making that family whole, being able to finally go home. So there were certain aspects of the job that were just amazing and fulfilling. Critical care medicine is fun. A lot of people might think that's peculiar, but it is fun to be on the cutting edge and to be taking care of children who are so ill that without an ICU, they would not survive. So I liked both aspects of it. I liked the intensive medicine and I liked all of the parents and getting to know them. They were very inspiring and always very courageous. It was a difficult thing for parents to go through. I can imagine, I can imagine that it was, and I know that that is a tough thing to do. A lot of my friends are physicians in healthcare, working in hospitals, ER, ICU, and some of the stories that they share when we get together are just heartbreaking. And yet, you know, they also have the triumphant stories, the wonderful stories. And I've also, you know, as a, a family member. I've had family members who were had babies who were premature or mm-hmm. had other conditions and so experienced that 
you know, secondhand, I'm going to say vicariously because I was visiting the right. hospital and trying to support them, but it's not the same of, as actually going through that experience and seeing a positive outcome. I, I'm sure there were times when it wasn't, you know, what, what we would have wanted, but seeing a positive outcome is anytime we work hard and long, it's always a good, good feeling. Oh, it is. It's wonderful. What were some of the life lessons you learned from your years in healthcare? And I, I know what transformations there have been in technology, right, materials, right. and equipment during that time because of what, you know, I do. You know, as I shared earlier, it seems like every single thing along the way from <laughs> tutoring to working at Burger King to having my own practice, I learned some life lessons that were so practical and applicable to everything that I do and still do. What were some of your life lessons? Well, the greatest one is the one that I miss the most since retirement. And that is being part of a great team. Mm -hmm. A skilled team is a wonderful thing. The physicians got to be the bosses of the team, but there were nurses and nurse practitioners and respiratory therapists and social workers and lactation consultants. And I could not do my job and the family could not survive the experience without all the members of the team. And so I learned how important that it is to appreciate the workers around you and the members in your workplace who contribute. It takes all of us. It is never just one person. And so the importance of teamwork is my major life lesson. Another one is not presuming to know what other people are thinking. Oh, good one. <laughs> the mothers, the moms who had premature babies or sick infants were generally terrified and they would rarely admit to how helpless they felt. Sometimes they would admit to feeling guilty when in fact they did not do anything to cause the birth of their premature infant. And if I just made assumptions about how a mother felt, I missed opportunities to help her get through this difficult experience. We could see in the NICU some moms becoming depressed. We could talk with them. We could uh, suggest that they go to their healthcare provider and, and and or psychotherapist to get medication or therapy because we knew that a baby would do better with a healthy mother to go home to. And so I really enjoyed getting to know the moms especially and learning not to make any assumptions, to get to know them, to gain their trust, and once I gained their trust, to begin to talk to them in a way that I could really help them. They weren't my patient. Their child was my patient. But they were part of the whole process of healing the child. And so I learned how important parents are, especially moms, to healing babies. Okay. And I just think that's a wonderful lesson for everybody to remember. You know, children, babies especially, are not independent. They grow up in the context of parents and family. And everything we think about children uh, really should be in terms of how the whole family is working. So you were saying about the life lessons you learned, which I really, really think are good, the, the teamwork and the not assuming we make so many assumptions about what people are thinking or why they're behaving or some a certain way or why they're in a mood. And just that lesson of, you know, talking, communicating, trying to figure out what's really going on is critical. And you're mentioning mothers a lot, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've got some really involved dads now. Did you see the depressions, the emotional swings in, in the fathers as well? Uh, some, but it's different for dads. Uh, in general, the dads were more cautious. Moms mm -hmm. and dads even visited at different times of the day. Now, kangaroo care is something that parents love in the NICU. That's where the baby wearing only a diaper 
is snuggled up against the mother's chest with a warm blanket put over the baby. And it's done to increase mom's breast milk production and improve bonding and the babies grow better. But the dads love to do kangaroo care too. I'm sure. You know, yeah. You know, I think the, the dads were just more hesitant. Uh, they would read to their children, they would visit, they would do kangaroo care, but it was mostly the moms who held a bedside vigil during the NICU uh, stay. And so I don't know if that's the different way men and women process their feelings, mm -hmm. but it's not to say that the dads were not involved. They were right. very involved. Yeah. Right. I did not see any depression among the fathers. I did diagnose several cases of depression among the mothers and, and we got moms the help they needed. You yeah. know, the other thing I really enjoyed about the NICU was being a cheerleader for breastfeeding. Uh, pumping breast milk for women who have a baby that's sick in the NICU or a child in the hospital is really difficult. And these moms would have to pump and express their breast milk for sometimes weeks before they would ever get a chance to nurse their baby. Aww. And we know now that breastfeeding is so good to prevent infections for babies. Premature babies even have better brain development as a result of breast milk feedings. And so I was always enthusiastic and helpful with the mothers so that they would have successful breastfeeding of their small infants. Good to know. Uh, you asked, yeah, you asked me another uh, about life lessons from the NICU. And because I know there are lots of working mothers listening to this podcast, I wanted to mention there's no such thing as a super mom. Mm. I set out to be the best doctor, and I was that before I became a mother, and then the best mother that I could be when I had my children. And I struggled to do everything. Early in my career, I worked too many hours. I did too many research projects. I might have been away from home too much. And then I gave myself a hard time with guilt when I did work a lot, when I did miss things that my kids uh, did, when I didn't make it to the preschool for the Mother's Day tea. I was fortunate to have friends who were in the same phase of life as me. And we talked about how difficult it was to juggle full-time work and being a mom. And so over the first oh, seven to 10 years of my being a mother, I think I learned to accept that there were things that I could do with and for my children. And I always enjoyed time off away from the hospital with my family. But when I was at work, I concentrated on being the very best physician I could be. And being a great physician allowed me to be a good enough mother. So I went from expecting myself to be a perfect mom to accepting that I was a good enough mother. All right. Well, that is the top lesson right there, as a matter of fact, is, is that having that community. I, I hear that you were having communication. You weren't keeping it to yourself, how you were feeling, which we are prone to do, not just in the hospital, but outside of it as well, putting on that superwoman mask. Right. And uh, well, I guess that was Batwoman who wore a mask. Uh, Supergirl was... <laughs> Supergirl's just kind of out there in her hot boots and a cape. Not very good crime fighting gear. Thank you for, for sharing that because that's early and often needs to be known and repeated and ingrained. We don't get to a point where we don't stop trying to uh, achieve perfectionism and trying to do everything for everybody. Really, really good lesson learned from somebody who has been there and gone through it. You were, you were raising children of your own at the time. We've been talking about the babies mostly and other people's uh, children. What was it like at home 
I mean, you, you shared the challenges that, that you had and that you talked to your friends about, but what was it like at home trying to practice medicine and, and raising three children? Well, I was lucky to be married to a physician who was also a pediatrician. So he was good with kids. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and we were fortunate in that we could afford to have a nanny. So when I was away at work, on call in the hospital at night, I knew that either he or the nanny was looking after my kids. Uh, we had three children, a son and two daughters. They were all different, each different from the other, and each one presented different challenges. And there were times when I had a hard time being a mom to three kids and a full-time physician. One time when my uh, youngest, was having difficulty learning to read, and we discovered she had dyslexia, I had to do a lot of extra work to figure out how to get her evaluated, her hearing, her vision, her developmental progress, and that took a lot of my energy and time away from work. There was another time when my older daughter um, in high school developed an eating disorder. And I was so worried about this that I cut back my hours to part-time so that I could take her to all of the therapy and medical appointments that she needed so that I could help her get the care that she needed. So there were times when I did not work full-time if something of major importance was going on with one of my children. But for the most part, I learned to accept the time that I would have with my children. And, and it was easy because my husband was a great father. And I learned that being a physician allowed me to be a better mother. That's what I mean by being a good enough mother. Mm -hmm. working, working moms have to accept that if they like their job and their jobs are fulfilling, that allows them to be a better person and a better mother, I believe. I, I believe so as well. I was a working mother and uh, had a private dental practice and uh, my two children, I was married at the time when they were young and it, it is good to have a two parent household and to be able to help, even if you can't, you know, afford a, a nanny, if you have to do daycare or use a family member, it is just really, really imperative that you figure out a way to get some help because yeah. the working is fulfilling. It's purposeful. We're passionate about it and it gives us energy moves us forward in ways that we need. You know, we're multidimensional yeah. people, as important as yeah. it is being a mother or a wife. We're also here with skills and gifts that we want to share with the world, that we are to share with the world in my mind. So trying to figure out how to do all of that and without making the sacrifice of, of ruining your kids or screwing up at work is something else. But it sounds like you were able to do it. And I'm I'm really glad that you're sharing how you moved to that, how you got to the point of retirement. Yay for you. <laughs> so that well, you know, while, can do it. Yeah. Right. while I was a working mother, I had to learn to prioritize taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. The other thing I know your listeners will identify with is when I got really busy at work or the kids got busy, I would put myself on the back burner. And it took me a long time to say, hey, if I don't go for that run, if I don't go exercise, if I don't go have lunch with a friend, even coffee in the hospital, I'm not taking care of myself and I won't have the energy I need. So I did have hobbies when my kids were little. I did exercise on a fairly regular basis. I did have date nights with my husband. Nice. I did. I learned to do the things that I needed to do to keep myself okay again, so that I could be a better doctor and a better mother. And all moms go through that. We have to learn what our limits are. We have to learn how to take care of ourselves. And if we don't, 
we end up getting more angry, getting more tired, getting more frustrated. And then it's a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure. And that leads to burnout for working mothers when yes, they're truly, does. truly overwhelmed. Speaking of burnout, that was my next question. At what point in your career did you experience burnout? When and how did this happen? Did, did some particular event precipitate it or was it just a series of things and the not sleeping and the perfectionism? How did that, how did that occur? I had a working mother burnout in my early 40s. After the birth of my third child, we moved to a new city. My physician, excuse me, my husband had a great new job for him and my job was just okay. And after moving the household and finding new schools and uh, ending up uh, without my friends and my support network, I didn't like my new job and I became more and more unhappy and more and more angry. My husband was having a great time. He Mm. loved his new job. And so I became quite honestly depressed. I became clinically depressed, but I was able to keep working. And once my friends at work at the hospital said, I think you might be depressed. I was having trouble sleeping. I was always in a bad mood. I had lost my appetite. I had stopped exercising. And she suggested that I go to a therapist, friend of hers. And I did. And this psychiatrist helped me sort through all of the issues. How much was work? How much were the children? How much was marriage? How much was self-care? What, what things were contributing to my unhappiness? And with his professional help, I was able to sort through my priorities, make sure that I put myself on the list as a priority too, and I started to heal and get better. My husband and I did a lot of work on our marriage. We had been married at that time about 10 years, Mm -hmm. and we decided over the course of a year um, to actually leave that city and leave that job that he thought was so wonderful because we wanted to go somewhere where we both could have the jobs that we needed to be successful. And that is another lesson right there that communicating with the spouse, listening to each other and, you know, being interested in each other's development and happiness. And that is not selfish at all. Uh, That's taking care of yourself and not leading to those negative emotions that you were having that will impact the relationship. You can't just ask somebody to keep sacrificing everything that's important to them, including their personal happiness, and expect that to go well long term. And that I think that leads to a lot of divorces. So I'm glad you guys were able to work through that and that he listened. It had to be hard, hard to give up a job or colleagues, team situation that he liked, but to find something that you both were mutually uh, beneficial in, in that situation for me, even if it's, you know, less pay or you have to downsize. And I'm saying this for whoever might not be, you mm-hmm. know, in the position that you guys were in who think, well, I can't do that. Yeah, there are changes you can make and you got to change your mindset to how can we? Not I can't, not it's impossible, but how can we? And and that just opens up your vision to different avenues and it may just be moving. It may be another job. There there are a lot of different scenarios. If you look at it, you know, glass half full. So I'm glad you are, are sharing all of these things that, that you've been through because I know people were looking at you and thinking, oh, Susan, Dr. Landers, mm-hmm. she's a doctor. Her husband's a doctor. They got the three perfect kids. I, I just know, <laughs> you know, you're talking about assuming things about what people are thinking and how they are feeling. And that makes it even harder sometimes to admit, you know what, I'm not so happy. Yeah, right. I got some good stuff, but I'm not so happy. The moms in the NICU would always tell me stories about their children, older children. And I would say, oh, my God, my kid does that, too. And they would look and say, oh, you're kidding. Your children must be perfect. And I said, no, no way. None of us has perfect children. 
Our we all lives. have <laughs> right. We we all do the best that we can. We all have trouble with our children, different phases, different stages are harder than others. And it is just, that is what being human is all about. I was lucky that my husband was willing to make the change so that we both could be happy. And before he made that change, I actually deviated into a different role. I left the NICU and I took a job as as a medical director for a small HMO. And it was easy. It was nine to five. It, uh, there was some travel. It wasn't a difficult job, but it, it wasn't me. It wasn't medicine and it wasn't taking care of patients and it didn't feel right. So even though I tried to do something different, he could tell that and I could tell that it, it wasn't right for him or me. And we did as a couple face our issues and we weren't willing to destroy our marriage or our family. And so we decided together to move to a place where we both could be fulfilled. Excellent. Excellent. Good relationship advice here. And we're not just talking about Burnout, depression, anxiety, hard jobs, but communication, the the key, the core to so much of of what we want and need to do is simply talking it out and listening and that he was observant and realized even if you didn't say it, that you weren't, you weren't particularly happy. So, oh yeah, he knew, he knew there, there's an old adage, if mama ain't happy, ain't Ain't nobody nobody happy. happy. (laughs) My husband said that after a while. I said, honey, it's really true. He said, I know, because the kids can tell whenever you're upset about something. And it it is true. It's probably true if daddy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy too. But for our family, I was the bellwether. And when I became unhappy, uh, we knew that we had to do something. And the next move was perfect. His job turned out to be a great opportunity for him. Mine put me right back in the NICU. We were able to move to Austin, Texas. We had both always wanted to live there. And our children went to public school. In this other city, they had been in private school and it was costing a fortune. Mm -hmm. So we were both really happy to get back into public school situations because we thought that was the best. And so even though the move was uh, a big deal, we did it together. We talked about all the pros and cons. We decided what was best for the whole family. And I'm really proud that we've made it through that difficult period. I'm, I'm happy for you too. And I love me some Austin. I lived there for eight <laughs> years. I go back often. It's my second home. I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area where it is sweltering right now, but oh. this is, this is my home uh, where I grew oh. up, but I, Austin is fantastic. I just hearing it made me, made me smile. Good oh, things good. happen there. Other than the traffic, good things happen in Austin. Right, so. right. Yeah, it's a great city. You spend time now talking to other young healthcare professionals, uh, young physicians about physician burnout. What type of advice do you give them that's more specific to that profession? Uh, nurses and doctors tend to be very perfectionistic very motivated to help others and to do a good job. All of us set ourselves up for overload from burnout unless we learn, excuse me, unless we learn to look for the signs and symptoms of burnout. When I was older in my early 60s, I noticed that I became physically exhausted more than just being on call. Mm -hmm. I noticed that I became emotionally overwhelmed more than just being in the ICU. It it felt heavier. And I developed a cynicism and a negative attitude. It was distinctly different. It was like, oh gosh, uh, here we go. Another tiny premature baby. And uh, one of the nurses said to me, you are so negative. What's going on? And I thought about it. And I still didn't realize what was going on. 
when I would go to the hospital to take call at night, I would kind of hide in the call room and, and not want to talk to the nurses or the parents. And that wasn't like me. I loved walking around the unit and talking to people. Mm -hmm. What actually happened is that I felt no more satisfaction from my role. I felt no more sense of fulfillment. And that was when I was truly burned out. I had let my work hours and my job situation and some difficult patient um, situations, some complex ethical issues get to me. And it's easy to do in the ICU. Sometimes you can't help but get wrapped up in a case where the ethical issues are challenging. Mm -hmm. And we had several babies that had complicated birth injuries um, and birth defects. And it kind of got to me. And you know, one of my partners <clears throat> said, you don't seem like yourself. Have you lost your compassion? And I thought about it not that instant, but later on. And I said, that is exactly what's happened. I'd lost my sense of compassion. And that's when I knew I was burned out. I'm so worried, Dr. Mo, about nurses and doctors, nurse practitioners during this pandemic. They're exhausted. They were challenged in a way that was ungodly. They worked extra shifts. They saw extra patients. They saw people die. Their offices were full. People were unhappy. There were different opinions about vaccines. There was stress. It was political. It was not just public health and medicine and nursing. It was political. And that really wore again, doctors and nurses enjoying caring for other people. So the rates of burnout went up. And if any of the people listening to this podcast have a loved one that's a doctor or a nurse or a respiratory therapist, please ask them to talk about their feelings, ask them questions about what they've been through and what they think about it. Notice if they're staying to themselves. Notice if they're hiding away. Notice if they're drinking more or smoking marijuana more. Notice if they're angry. Those are signs that healthcare providers show when they're burned out. Burnout is really an important thing for us to talk about because sometimes physicians and nurses who don't get help feel hopeless and the rate of suicide really goes up when a physician is burned out. I'm not sure about those statistics for nurses, but I've heard recently even that pharmacy, pharmacist suicide rates during the pandemic went up. So the message that I'm saying to other healthcare providers if we, is we've just been through this terrible pandemic where we all worked so hard, there were lots of deaths, there, there were lots of terrible situations, access to care, vaccine politics, and we have to talk about it and recognize that it was a very trying time. And we have to try to deal with our feelings and our loved ones have to help us deal with our feelings. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what's interesting to me, what struck me as you were speaking, Dr. Landers, is that I recently interviewed a veteran and a mental health uh, professional, mm -hmm. and they said almost verbatim what you just said about the post-traumatic stress, right? the impact of it. And it's, you know, not just veterans in combat now. And of course, the, the counselors were hearing everybody's story. They were seeing the spiritual deaths of so many people and, and mm -hmm. overwhelmed with the number of people needing appointments and the issues they were dealing with. And then to have to 
you know, process that and try to have your own life is, is not something we're naturally equipped to do. So yes, families reach out, support your physician, family members, your veterans, anybody who's really dealing with the uh, public, dealing with emergencies, dealing with the crises, the, uh, I'm sure, uh, law enforcement also experienced this. We oh, yeah. have seen things, you know, like, they've never been in, in my lifetime no. uh, since and during, I mean, during and since the pandemic. So it's just, right, yeah, right. It, it, you know, I, they can, I just want to make that broad for the people who, who may not be relate, equating that to what's going on with them, but PTSD can happen to anyone. And it, you know, you may call it burnout or we used to call it a nervous breakdown those aren't mm -hmm. the correct terms but for those who like me have a tendency to <laughs> not update their vocabulary as fast as as uh, the oxford dictionary would have us do so it's all within the same spectrum of emotional mental health issues that can lead yeah. to all of those problems that you're talking about, especially the, the drug and the drinking. And now you've got a group that has access to uh, drugs as well. So that's that's scary. And I'm glad yeah. you're bringing attention to it. And let's talk about how you're doing that, how you're sharing this information beyond being a great guest on my podcast. You've got some resources and you have a have a book out as well. Tell us about those. Well, I, yes, I've been giving webinars for nurse practitioners, and I have developed a checklist for working mothers. Uh, if you go to my website, susanlandersmd.com forward slash burnout, your listeners will find a free checklist. It has about 24 items on it that helps working mothers assess whether or not they might be burned out. I also have a, a guide called Solution for Working Mother Burnout, but it works for healthcare provider burnout as well. Um, again, it's available on my website. I have been giving webinars and I have been speaking locally to healthcare groups about how to recover from burnout. And you know, it's important to talk about our feelings, but that's not the only thing people need to do to recover. Mm -hmm. It took me almost two years to recover from burnout. And I think it was because I was still working, but I did cut my hours back. I did change my practice location, which is a recommendation. I exercised more. I did meditation. I took some classes, yoga. I took piano lessons because playing music for me was very relaxing. And I picked up some old hobbies that I used to enjoy. And so I did a number of things in addition to talking with a therapist about the issues. Burnout's not going to go away overnight. If people are really burned out, especially for doctors or nurses or EMTs or uh, veterans or police officers, they're going to need to do some things to repair the trauma that they've been through. And it's going to take some real TLC, some real self-care, I believe. And so I've made um, available my teaching on my website. And I also wrote a book after I retired. So Many Babies is a book about my life balancing a medical career and motherhood. Hopefully it's a reassuring story to other working mothers. Uh, nurse practitioners and, and women physicians love to read this book because they find that they can identify with it. <clears throat> I think all working mothers have the same challenges. And so I hope my book is reassuring to the average everyday working mother, because I talk about those issues where we're challenged and mm -hmm. pulled between in different directions. We're pulled to our work or we're pulled to our children. And all mothers, all parents get pulled in these directions. Yes, so 
Yeah, so I'm doing a number of different things in addition to being on social media, but teaching and speaking is my favorite. And it's clear why you've certainly got a, a passion for helping others and you've made a lifelong commitment to do so. Kudos to you. Thank you for sharing these uh, symptoms and these strategies and tips for moving forward and healing. And like you said, you don't get over it overnight, but just remember it took some time to get into that state as well. So recovery will take time, but stay with it. Anyone dealing with burnout, depression, anxiety, just stay with it, get help and start upping your level of self-care. As you heard Dr. Landers explain, we'll drop your website in the notes and I'll repeat it again, susanlandersmd.com. Guys, go there, get your free checklist, <laughs> avail yourself of our other resources and bring her in hospitals, healthcare systems, bring her in to talk to your groups. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Dr. Landers. Continued success. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Mo. You're a delightful to talk with and I love what you're doing on this podcast. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and reu. Thank you.